Hello there, my name is Rob Gilbert and um, I am the director of the Kaleva Centre in Evolution and Human Sciences here at Magdalen College. Um, just for those who don't uh, know about the centre, it was founded over 10 years ago through the generous donation of Stephen Butt to the college which has endowed the centre so that it can now fund a series of research projects which are of different shapes and sizes. Some of them are studentships, some involve postdoctoral research associates, some are internship based. One of the major activities we've been uh, focusing on, though, are a series of seminars, termly, which have, in particular, show showcased the projects that we've been funding, and indeed we have uh, one of those coming up, uh, which is a fortnight yesterday, as it were, um, uh, which is on um, uh, when despots become deadly. One of our projects based on looking at how language uh, is used by dictators and would-be dictators. So we've got those, that series of events ongoing, but we also have wanted to start a public lecture series. And this has been a project that we've discussed for a while and really wanted to um, begin as soon as we can with a, a high profile and, and, and of wide interest lecture. And we're delighted that Linda Eggert has agreed to come and give the lecture today from the Faculty of Philosophy and as a, a fellow at Balliol College. Uh, and this lecture, as with all our seminars, is also being streamed online, so welcome to those who are joining us online. And uh, it will also be available afterwards on the Kaleva website, as all our seminars and lectures are going to be, so there will be an ongoing resource for the outputs from the centre. Thank you very much indeed to Linda for coming to speak to us today, and thank you to you all for coming. And uh, of course, at the end, it will be great to have questions uh, following Linda's lecture, but now I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you very much for um, Rob for the kind of introduction and the warm welcome. And um, thank you very much also to Hampton for the organization and indeed to the patients for my um, outrageously slow email responses. It's wonderful to be here with you um, all this evening. Uh, it's lovely to see some familiar faces. Uh, slightly alarming to see so many people I don't know yet, um, but very excited to be here and to share a little bit about my um, work with you. So I was asked to say something about the Kaleva Center's um, chosen theme, which I was told um, concerned AI and risks to human flourishing. And that's hardly a mind today on which those issues are not, including among philosophers. And I was asked to say something accessible to the general public, not just of interest to three philosophers. Um, at least that's how I interpreted the instructions. Um, so my aim tonight isn't to say anything terribly sophisticated about philosophy. Um, it's not to present a thought experiment or problem and then to give you or propose a solution to that um, problem or puzzle. It's to do something a bit different. It's basically a real experiment in trying to think through a challenge together. Now, there's a certain camp of philosophy that's been um, in the news recently, that's been pretty prominent, um, which essentially takes a theory and then applies that theory to any problem it can find. And um, Joe Wolfe, who's here at Oxford in political philosophy, um, has this wonderful distinction between applied philosophy and engaged philosophy. And um, one, just one issue with taking a theory and applying it to whatever problem you can find is that you basically proceed as if you'd already found the solution um, before you've even really you know, tried to understand the problem. And so part of my aim this evening is to share with you a little bit about a different way of doing philosophy. Um, that's a lot less prominent, but tries to engage in philosophical reflection um, about issues um, of public concern by starting with understanding the problem. Um, it's not about identifying some kind of favorite theory and then applying that to the problem. Um, it's about identifying what values are at stake and 
why they matter. So for those of you who don't know me, um, my background is in moral and in political philosophy. So I'm not, strictly speaking, uh, or in any sense really, a philosopher of technology or an AI ethicist, whatever that means. Um, and issues raised by AI first crept onto my research agenda um, during my default, when I was um, working on the ethics of war and defensive harming. And it happened through autonomous weapon systems. Um, philosophers writing about AI who are concerned about military applications of AI. And it also happens through um, what the philosopher Francis Cum described as the users and abuses of the trolley problem. So I kind of got dragged into this field by philosophers worrying about military applications of AI and then everyone else who suddenly got very interested in the trolley problem. But now, anyone who isn't completely indifferent to you know, major issues confronting humanity um, will find it very difficult not to be gripped by questions about the social implications of AI. Um, and so I'm interested in these issues in a very similar um, capacity to many other people in the university who try to be responsive to the major issues um, of our time, so very much in the spirit of the Kaleva Center as well. Um, and so as a result, I've become pretty preoccupied with the relationship between AI, human rights, and democracy. Um, and with questions like what we owe to one another as we continue to make AI more powerful and more prevalent. And more specifically, I'm interested in the ethics of delegating um, to AI and questions like what, if anything, we might lose as, when we start um, to eliminate human decision-making in certain contexts. And that brings us to the topic of this evening which is the idea of a right to human decision. Now here's where this is both interesting and important. Um, and those things don't always overlap, not least in philosophy, but I think, at least in this area, luckily they do. We all know now that AI penetrates most areas of human activity, whether or not we like it, and virtually any commentary on AI ethics includes some version of the sentence, machine learning algorithms are used to make decisions, consequential decisions about people's lives um, that affect them in all kinds of different ways. You know, decisions like um, whether a person is admitted to university, whether they will get a job, whether they have to go to jail. To name just a few examples, the list goes on. And in discussions about this, both in the public and in academia, one idea that continues to come up is some version of the right to human decision. It's ideas like human oversight, keeping the human in the loop, meaningful human control, appropriate levels of human judgment, particularly in the military context, or indeed, a right to human decision. And this idea, has also already started to make its way into some law. Hang on, there we go. Um, so for example, the GDPR, the EU's um, General Data Protection Regulation, includes language meant to protect people from decisions based solely on automated processing. And according to legal scholars, this is part of a much, much larger trend. The expectation is that more and more jurisdictions will recognize the importance of human decision-making, and increasingly many scholars, mostly legal scholars so far, are calling a right to human decision. But no jurisdiction has so far defined precisely what this right entails what its scope is, or indeed how it might be justified. And while there's an important emerging body of legal scholarship on this, there has, as of yet, not been very much careful philosophical treatment of the matter. And that's where some of my work 
and um, did much of the work that happens at the Institute for Ethics and AI um, here in Oxford comes in. So my concern here this evening is with perhaps one of the most fundamental questions in this area. What could ground, how might we justify a right to human decision? So considering the very idea itself of a moral right not to be subjected to fully automated decision making in consequential contexts, how might such an idea itself be explained? How might such a right be justified? So this is not the same thing as asking, is there a moral right? Or should there be a legal right to a human decision? Right. The question is, what reasons might there be for defending such a right in the first place? And so what I want to explore is the, what you might call the moral basis of such a right, and its relation to other values, both moral and political. And what I want to suggest, not necessarily to convince you of anything, but pr primarily as an invitation for further reflection and engagement, is that a right to human decision is actually, maybe surprisingly, difficult to justify. Not impossible, though. And I want to be clear that the intuition here that high-stakes decisions that will significantly affect people's lives should be limited to human agents is enormously compelling. It's very widely shared, and I myself am very sympathetic to that idea also. But my interest coming from philosophy is in whether we can trust this instinct. And I want to explore what kinds of normative commitments something like a right to a human decision might presuppose. And there are three things that I want to suggest. First, there are moral grounds for thinking that there might be a right to a human decision. But they're not what we might think. Second, defending a right to a human decision might give us more than we bargained for. And defending a right to a human decision, we might end up having to defend a bunch of things that we didn't actually originally set out to defend. And third, individual rights can't do everything. In fact, what the right to human decision is meant to address might be better achieved in the end by also considering broader considerations of justice that, in the end, can't be reduced to individual rights. Okay, that's it. We can all go home now. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to do much kind of outlining of assumptions and definitions and so on. Um, I don't know how people do this in other disciplines, um, but often in my discipline, you spend some time in the beginning kind of giving key definitions, outlining assumptions, a bunch of clarifications, that kind of stuff. Um, I won't really do much of that. I'll try to do just the bare minimum so everyone can be on the same page. So first, my concern here is with a moral right, not a legal right. Moral rights don't depend on their political recognition or enforcement. So my aim is also not to look at existing law um, and try to work out you know, how existing law might be interpreted to imply a right to human decision, and it's not to assess legislation that might be um, in the works, has been proposed, anything like that. Um, not that that's not important, but legal scholars are better positioned to do that kind of work. And my interest here, in any case, is in a question that arises at the more fundamental level, how we might justify a right in the first place. Second... I'm not going to, ooh, there we go. I'm not going to take the label right to human decision literally. Um, it's possible that what we're calling right might ultimately amount to not much more than just important interests that we might have. 
right? And lots of important interests that we have don't amount to rights, like think about right to friendship, for example. That is not really a thing. We have important interest in having friends, of course. Um, concerning the label human, of course there are lots of humans to whom we wouldn't want to entrust certain important decisions, right? So I'm not going to assume that we're interested in just having some, uh, any kind of person uh, make a decision. I'm going to assume that what people usually mean as a human person with certain characteristics. Um, and more generally, maybe what we ultimately mean is a certain kind of human involvement rather than any kind of particular decision, however defined. So I'm going with the label because that's the emerging trend. Um, but I'm not going to take any of those elements of the label, literally, necessarily. Um, and if just the label itself, the right to human decision, sounds too loaded to you, you might just think of it as a right, a negative right, not to be subject to fully automated decision-making in certain contexts. Okay. Third, I'm going to set aside questions about the quality of decisions. Um, because if decisions generated by AI are foreseeably worse than those made by humans, then that's kind of the end of the story. Then we don't really need to go any further. Um, what I want to explore is, even if we set aside concerns about the quality of the decisions, what reasons might we have for caring about something like a right to human decision? Fourth, I assume that what matters are decisions of a certain degree of moral significance. And for example, it's not about whether um, an algorithm can correctly classify cats as cats and dogs as not cats. Um, it's about decisions where the stakes are a bit higher. So for ease of reference, you might um, think of robot judges, for example, which legal scholars are increasingly discussing. Okay, finally, emerging technologies are very much a moving target. Today's technological limits might be pretty much gone tomorrow. Um, it's impossible to keep up with the news, and terms of art also rapidly evolve. Um, so for tonight, I want to try to stay away from as much of that as possible. Um, and I want to focus on the foundational questions that, in a sense, withstand technological change. So my aim is to take a step back, um, take a step back from the frantic speed at which everything is happening, um, and to focus on the fundamental questions that have a claim on our attention, no matter how quickly the technology develops, or even really where, where it goes. Again, very much in line with the Kaleva Center's um, ethos of trying to arrive at a you know, deeper understanding of continuing challenges, ongoing challenges facing humanity. So, you have started to get a sense that the territory that I'll try to map isn't in any sense a you know, comprehensive guide or anything to deciding, say, what decisions we should or shouldn't outsource. Nothing of the sort. Um, my aim is rather more exploratory, as to see how we might approach justifying a moral right to human decision. What reasons might we have for trying to defend the existence of such a right? And that's just a very small part, but arguably a very important part of a much, much bigger picture. Okay, so much for preliminary remarks, and I warned you that was just the bare minimum. So, with that, let's go a bit deeper now. Some of you might be wondering, why? Why ask the question in the first place? And I think there are at least two good reasons for asking how a right to human decision might be justified. First, I think it's important to know not just what our values and principles are, but also why we hold them. In particular, we need to know whether a right to human decision matters 
instrumentally for other goods and values that it helps um, promote and protect, or whether it matters for its own sake. Because if we find at the end of our inquiry that right to a human decision matters not for its own sake, but rather the, to promote other rights and other values, then it means that our justification is going to be contingent, dependent on a bunch of circumstances. And then it's possible that what we really want is actually not a right to a human decision, but what the legal scholar Aziz Huck calls a right to a well-calibrated machine decision. So ultimately, asking this question is about getting clearer about our ends. It's about shining a light on what's ultimately at stake. And increasingly common calls for you know, human oversight, um, human control, and a right to human decision, and so on. So part of my aim, given the discipline that I'm coming from, is to make morality, to make our moral commitments, um, our normative commitments, more explicit. And that's the spread of tonight's inquiry. But there are also practical implications. Because if it turns out that this asserted right ultimately has no ground to stand on, and that our bias towards human decision-making is actually unjustified, then a right to human decision isn't something that we can appeal to in trying to make sense of the social implications of AI, um, and in trying to understand the moral implications of ever-increasing algorithmic decision-making, or even in you know, devising laws and justifying regulation. All that's to say, there's a lot at stake. And the roadmap for tonight is very simple. So I want to explore, which isn't the same thing as defend, three different approaches that one might take in trying to justify a right to human decision. They focus broadly on human dignity, democratic values, and moral understanding. There may well be more, and um, I'm very keen to hear from people what else you might think um, is going on. For the moment, my aim is to say just a little bit about each approach and to see what kind of promise each approach um, might hold for grounding a right to a human decision. Um, so it's not a matter of arguing for one approach and then rejecting the others, but this is meant to be a wholly constructive talk, to make some progress towards answering our, our question. But I do want to suggest that those of us who want to defend a right to human decision must be willing to take on board a bunch of tendentious commitments. And so defending a right to human decision might ultimately be a much more involved and demanding commitment than it might seem at first glance. Um, it might be a little bit like getting a dog, like really fun and exciting idea, but um, a lot of work, a lot of commitment. You kind of need to know all the different things that it entails. So I'll walk through the three potential approaches, dignity, democratic values, and moral understanding. And I'll try to sort of sketch what each of them might tell us about how we could justify a right to human decision. And hopefully that will bring us a little closer to answering our question. So let's start with the most prominent consideration. When you ask people what's wrong with being subjected to automated decision making, by far the most common answer is that it violates human dignity. What makes it very difficult to assess what can be said in support of this claim is that appeals to human dignity are often incredibly vague and kind of hand-wavy. Um, 
the philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer um, labeled dignity the shibboleth of all the perplexed and empty-headed moralists who concealed behind that imposing expression their lack of any real basis for morals. Um, about most people understand dignity basically as some, um, some sort of worthiness of respect. Very broadly, you might say, dignity is violated when people are treated as less worthy than they, than they really are. Um, and this can happen in at least two different ways. Um, the first is relational. So we mustn't treat some human beings as worth less than others. And the second is um, broadly Kantian. Um, it's based on the idea that you know, um, individuals have an inner incomparable worth, which we might describe as a certain kind of immunity from um, being treated as fungible. So we mustn't reduce people to numbers and treat them as interchangeable. People have to be treated as individuals. And we can make things a little bit more concrete by exploring a few quite different um, contemporary conceptions of dignity in this context and ways in which they might help try to justify um, a right to human decision and how that's meant to help protect different ways of understanding dignity. And the first comes from a formulation um, by Chuck Bites, a political theorist at Princeton, who looked at different roles that dignity plays um, in philosophical and legal writing on human rights. So unsurprisingly, he found that there's a great number of wildly different ways in which people use the concept. Eventually, he proposed that we understand the notion as self-directing agency. And that's a deliberately minimalist conception that basically involves people seeing themselves as what he calls makers of claims. And applied in this particular context, thinking about worries about automated decision-making, the idea of self-directing agency might take the form of what we might describe as self-advocacy and contestation. So one possibility is that the right to human decision protects our interest in having decisions that affect us in certain ways um, be explained or justified to us. And this is the idea of explainability that's frequently discussed. Um, in fact, um, my friend and colleague, Kate Ruddenberg at the LSE, argues that our interest in self-advocacy is actually what grounds the right to an explanation. But it also protects our interest in explaining ourselves to a decision maker, giving reasons that we think should play a role in whatever decision is made about us. For example, um, Aziz Hakim I mentioned earlier, emphasizes the importance of a person's, and this is um, the bold a bit, ability to supply information and more generally to offer reasons for a decision to be made in favor, to be made in her favor to a human decision maker. And a related possibility is that we might want to be able to contest certain decisions that affect us. So the assumption is that we can better exercise this kind of agency, explaining ourselves on contesting decisions if we're interacting with a human decision maker rather than a non-human decision maker. Sounds plausible enough. But one worry is that this might not get us very far. Because you'll remember the question. If what's at stake is our ability to provide additional information um, the option of contesting a decision that's been made, say, by having a human decision maker review the decision afterwards and then either explain it to us or um, amend it, then there might not necessarily be a problem with AI-generated decisions per se, right? And then all we're really saying is that there should be a way of appealing a machine decision and having someone review that decision and either explain and justify that decision to us, or reverse and correct the decision. So if we're understanding dignity as self-directing agency in the sense, important though it is in general, this might not be the most robust 
foundation for right to human decision. Because it would imply that a human decision matters in a contingent way, in so far as this is what enables something like self-advocacy and contestability. If it turns out that these kinds of values can be better promoted and protected in other ways, then the right to human decision might become less important. And that's where this kind of justification might seem a bit shaky. Okay. Another possibility is based on a more Kantian conception of dignity, which is what I mentioned earlier. It's individuals inner and conditional, incomparable worth. Because one of the things that might trouble us about algorithmic decision making is that it fails to treat people as individuals. Right? And there's a sizable literature um, related issues of algorithmic bias and algorithmic fairness that address aspects of this. Some of you might have heard about um, the now notorious recidivism algorithm Compass in the US. Um, very basically, it's a decision support tool, a classification um, algorithm used to predict the probability of re-arrest um, for people if they're released pre-trial. So in many US states, when judges make um, decisions about um, bail and parole, they look at information um, that includes the output of a predictive model. Um, and that is used to predict whether the defendant um, poses a public safety risk. In effect, the prediction then helps to determine whether people are sent home, or whether they're sent to jail. If they're predicted to successfully reintegrate into society, um, they're sent home. If they're predicted uh, to commit violent crimes, they're sent to jail. Um, given the devastating consequences that come with being sent to jail, from job losses to wrecking families, these decisions, based on algorithm predictions, can be life-changing. And the problem is that not all predictions are accurate. In 2016, um, ProPublica, an investigative um, journalism organization revealed a bunch of interesting things that have been widely debated about the Compass algorithm. And to um, radically, and I really mean radically, simplify, um, one of the things that it revealed was that what was happening was that false predictions differ significantly between black people and white people. And there's a huge disparity um, in that the algorithm falsely labeled black people as high risk much more than white people, and it falsely labelled white people as low risk much more than black people. And there's a lot of debate about different um, aspects of this that we don't need to get into here. I mention this because it's one of the best-known examples where people worry that people aren't treated as individuals. So, when we think back about this question, one of the things that might trouble us about algorithmic decision making is that it fails, people, it fails to treat people as individuals when we think back to this, this aspect of dignity. Because algorithmic decision making necessarily relies on vast amounts of data and statistical information. And being mislabeled, partly as a result of that, can have devastating consequences for people. So a proponent of a right to human decision might point out that treating people on the basis of their perceived membership in some larger social group clearly fails to take them seriously as an individual. Algorithms make classification decisions on the basis of group-based generalizations. But someone defending a right to human decision might say, decisions that will severely impact people's lives, such as whether someone is sent to jail, should be made solely on the basis of people's own individual conduct, not on the basis of predictions about what they might do, predictions which are themselves based on what other people have done in the past. So one basic underlying intuition as the political theorist Caspar um, Lippert-Rasmussen formulates the thought, is that 
we ought, morally speaking, to treat others as individuals and not simply on the basis of statistical information about groups to which they belong, who are perceived to belong. Now, this type of a justification for right to human decision would say respecting people's dignity requires individualized treatment. And that requires a human decision maker. And that kind of argument would basically presuppose that algorithms will rely on non-individualized predictions and statistical information. And it would presuppose that human decision makers would, or at least could, judge people as individuals. But there's at least two kinds of issues with this attempt, this kind of attempt at justifying a right to human decision. First, as experts have pointed out, algorithms can in principle be designed to take account of all relevant information, statistical or non-statistical. Information isn't necessarily irrelevant just because it's statistical. The real problem arises when relevant information is left out and when people are judged based on information or based on things that don't matter. If there's nothing inherent in algorithms that prevents them from taking into account all relevant information, then the use of algorithms need not rule out the kind of individualized treatment that people are owed. Now, the second issue. There may be lots of situations where people actually have an interest in not being judged as who they truly are by another person. For example, um, philosophers like Jürgen Habermas and um, Abishai Magalit, when they think about dignity, um, they talk about dignity in terms of not being humiliated, the absence of humiliation. And that matters because people might have strong interest in certain situations and not being scrutinized and judged by fellow humans. For example, um, there's a, an AI therapy tool aptly um, called Robot, um, that people apparently find much easier to talk to than human therapists. And um, some of my students here actually told me that some people, when they're sad, talk to ChatGPT. So there might be situations where dignity requires protecting people's ability to avoid being judged by other humans. Okay, so taking a step back, these are just some snapshots, but at least these kinds of broadly dignity-based justifications for right to human decisions will, again, be pretty contingent, um, dependent on circumstances. The worry is that the grounds for right to human decision might not be as robust as we might think. So it seems that just appealing to a general interest in being judged um, as an individual by other persons won't do as a justification for right to human decision. Because what matters is being judged on the basis of relevant information, not more, not less. And this is something that algorithms might be able to do just as well as people, maybe even better. And in addition, there might be cases where people might actually have an interest in not being judged by other people. Okay. Now we've considered how one might ground a right to human decision by appealing to the notion of human dignity. So we thought about things like um, self-advocacy, contestability, that was this idea of self-directing agency. Um, we thought about individualized treatment and also the absence of humiliation. And we found that these kinds of considerations offer what might look like pretty shaky grounds for right to human decision. Because automated decision making might not necessarily be incompatible with the kinds of values that we think are at stake here. So justifying a right to human decision by appealing to certain dignity-based considerations is easier said than done once we try to make things more concrete. Okay. With that, we'll move on to the second cluster of considerations. And that's got to do with essentially democratic values. Now, a democracy-based justification um, for the right to human decision in general seems pretty intuitive. Basically, the whole point is that we want to govern ourselves, right, as peers. And so it seems that 
outsourcing any part of this just seems inappropriate when we think about the functions of democratic governance. But what might this mean for the question at hand? Well, one approach to justifying the right to human decision would be to say that such a right is actually necessary if we want to realize certain democratic values. If a right to human decision is itself indispensable for the realization of other recognized rights and values, then that kind of contributory role might help justify such a right. And in fact, one might think that a right to human decision is itself constitutive of democracy. And to think this, we don't really need to presuppose any specific view of what democracy is or why it's valuable in the first place. The right to human decision might itself contribute to the realization of other broadly democratic rights and values, regardless of whether these other rights and values are themselves advanced by or themselves a central element of democracy, forming a central element of that. So that's just to say that no matter what your view of um, democracy itself is, whether you think it's instrumentally valuable or non-instrumentally valuable, you might think that the right to human decision plays an important role, that it's intertwined with democratic values in certain ways. So this is our second starting point. Now, how might a right to human decision itself be constitutive of democracy? How might it form an essential element of democracy? Now, one consideration is relational equality. The idea of relating to one another as moral and political equals. We want to be judged by our peers. It's all about judging one another as equals and governing ourselves collectively. Outsourcing any part of that to AI, one might think, just goes against this egalitarian spirit. And another consideration is transparency. Um, the right to human decision might be integral to what the political philosopher Thomas Cristiano um, calls the publicity requirement of justice. So he says each citizen has fundamental interest in being able to see that he's being treated as an equal in a society where there's significant diversity among persons in the conditions of well-being and where there's disagreements about justice. Basically, the point is that we have an interest in being able to see to ascertain that we're all being treated as equals. What matters isn't just that justice is done, it also matters that it's done visibly, that we as members of society can see how justice is done. And given familiar worries about you know, opaqueness, lack of transparency, explainability, and so on, some imperative of publicity as a distinct feature of democratic society and democratic culture might be a distinct ground for right to human decision. It might help us realize other important values that we think matter in democracy. Transparency, the possibility to appeal, um, right to explanation, accountability, and so on. But again, even in this context, one might worry that we're exaggerating how, for example, transparent people themselves are. Um, some people have claimed that humans really are like black boxes themselves um, and that using algorithms might ultimately be more transparent. Now, in addition, and so far as we're concerned with democratic values like you know, autonomy and equal standing um, as citizens, more and more people are arguing that reducing human decision-making and relying, increasingly relying on automated decision-making and automated rule might actually be more effective in furthering those kinds of values, like equality and the rule of law. This isn't my view, but it's becoming increasingly prominent. And the thought is basically that automated systems can't exercise discretion and there's therefore never an arbitrary exercise of power they will always treat like cases alike, for example. And many people are very compelled by this idea. So where does that leave us? On one hand, it seems like there's something about democratic 
decision-making, the democratic ethos. That means that we shouldn't outsource certain decisions. On the other hand, various people have pointed out that eliminating human decision-making might actually also eliminate unwanted variability. So Kassansin is a very uh, prominent proponent of this view. And automating decision-making, if proponents are right, might at least in certain respects promote values like equality and the rule of law. So here's one response. It's possible to debate all kinds of empirical um, grounds for these statements. Right? You can get into arguments, for example, about what best eliminates the harmful effects of bias. But I think the strongest defense of a right to human decision in the end isn't going to deny any of these potential benefits, whether they're real or not. I think the most promising kind of defense is going to rest on what we would lose as a result of automating decision-making. And we'll try to show that whatever we would lose is worth preserving. Now, remember that my aim wasn't actually to justify and defend a right to human decision, but rather to illuminate what kinds of things we would need to be committed to to do so. But here are just a few of the considerations that might matter. And the first has to do with um, discretion. So maybe we actually want to preserve human discretion, even if there's a certain sense of arbitrariness involved in that. And the claim for proponent of this kind of view would be that arbitrariness isn't necessarily always bad, or rather that variation isn't actually arbitrary, um, but justified. For example, there might be many questions, including about justice, that people reasonably disagree about. And in a sense, that's arguably part of the point of democracy. So allowing human decision makers a certain degree of discretion is like an acknowledgement that regardless of whether there are moral truths, there's certainly no reason to think that those who program algorithms have special access to them. And so maybe variation is actually okay, at least so long as reasonable disagreement is. Um, and a related point is that there may simply be cases where diverging from rules is the right thing to do. For example, sometimes there's value in departing from rules um, where the circumstances of the individual case render that appropriate. And finally, we might think of something like what the legal philosopher Jeremy Waldron um, calls the right to do wrong. And maybe Waldron's right that there are certain contexts where there's something valuable about having the option to do wrong, but not doing so. If we take that option away, I mean, obviously we don't want people to do wrong, but if we take that option away, you might think we also remove the option of complying. And so we lose the value of doing the right thing when one had the option to do wrong. So that's a cluster of related considerations that you might appeal to in response to um, people who think that we can actually promote certain democratic values like equality, the rule of law, and so on by increasing automated decision making. Okay. So these are just some of the considerations we might try to mobilize to defend a right to human decision specifically against views that suggest that democracy might actually be furthered by automating more decision making. Now, say we wanted to ground a right to human decision-making in broadly democratic values. To do this, I think we'd need to do something that ties human decision-making into our view of democracy, so that we can insist on there being intrinsic value of human participation and governance with all its imperfections, opaqueness and variability, even if, though that's an open question, certain values like transparency and explainability could be better promoted by replacing human decision makers. And how appealing or worrying you find this kind of prospect, I think, will depend on what other 
commitments about democracy you have. For example, whether you think it's mainly valuable instrumentally, because it tends to bring about other values, because it tends to bring about good outcomes, or whether you think it matters for its own sake. So I think there's something, there's something interesting to be had about debates about democracy in the future and different justifications of democracy itself um, and what they commit us to different, um, what they commit us to when we think about different positions um, that we might have about the value of human decision making in general. But that's a conversation for the future. Okay, that brings us to the third cluster of considerations, which is wholly non-instrumental. And this is a much less common way of thinking about rights, um, but I think it's actually pretty attractive. To justify a right to human decision in completely non-instrumental terms would mean saying that it's valuable completely independently of its effects. It's not valuable because it can produce um, different outcomes, to use um, Tim Scanlon's description of rights. To justify a right to human decision on non-instrumental grounds would say that the right to human decision matters not just because it helps to protect other rights and values that are important to us, but because it expresses something important about people as rights holders. Um, the philosopher Francis Cam, in describing fundamental human rights, draws a distinction that gets to the heart of this. And she says, fundamental human rights are not concerned with protecting a person's interests, but with expressing his nature as a being of a certain sort, when his interests are worth protecting they express the worth of the person rather than the worth of what is in the interests of that person. So on this view, you see it's not about protecting people's interests necessarily. It's about protecting the worth of the person. It's about what makes their interests worth protecting in the first place. And this, by the way, is also... Um, an arguably more compelling way of thinking about some of the dignity-based considerations that you know, we started with. So I think there's something quite promising in this um, idea of the worth of the person as a distinctly non-instrumental ground for right to human decision. And the question is, could a right to human decision express something about people as rights holders in this sense? irrespective of other interests that people might have. And here is one possibility. It's something that goes to the core of morality itself. It's about doing the right thing for the right reasons and understanding why those reasons are right. And that's the idea of moral understanding, um, which philosopher Alison Hills over at St. John's um, has discussed in a slightly different context. She discusses it in the context of um, virtue and morally worthy action. And she says, morally worthy action is right action for the right reasons. If you have moral understanding and you act on that basis, you will act for the right reasons. Now, my concern here is not at all with um, virtue or morally worthy action um, or the question of why moral understanding might be important for those other values. But I, sti I still think the idea is really helpful. My suggestion is that if we want to justify the right to human decision on purely intrinsic and non-instrumental grounds as expressing something important about us as rights holders, it makes sense for it to ultimately concern the significance that we, as people, have in one another's reasoning. So assuming that the capacity of moral understanding is limited to humans, which at this point is relatively uncontroversial, this might be a third wholly non-instrumental and therefore potentially more robust ground for the right to human decision. 
And the idea here is that we want agents to make decisions, at least decisions of a certain degree and kind of significance, who understand the gravity of those decisions, having taken into account our status as rights holders. We want to figure in other people's deliberations about decisions that are going to affect us in certain ways. A related idea is that we don't just want decision makers to make the right decisions, even for the right reasons. We want them to want to make the right decisions for no other reason that those decisions are the right ones. So one reason then that we might care about the right to human decision is that as patients who are going to be affected by those decisions, we want to figure in the reasons that go into people's deliberations. Whether we're harmed or benefited a secondary, we want to have been taken into account in certain ways. And machine learning algorithms lack this capacity. They just excel at empirical predictions um, when they've got sufficient training data. So to justify a right to human decision on intrinsic, non-instrumental grounds, we might grant the right to human decision in the significance of moral understanding. So that's the third approach. So time to take a step back. I've sketched three very broad, completely different approaches um, based on dignity, democratic values, and understanding. And these three approaches I've suggested might help us try and justify a right to human decision in different ways. And in the process, I've begun to suggest two different things. First, the most straightforward justifications, and this also reflects how most people think about rights in general, are instrumental. But they also make the right to human decision contingent in a sense, meaning they leave open the possibility that maybe better algorithms and more advanced AI systems can get us what we really want. Because basically, the values that the right to human decision would then promote are for the most part extrinsic. Appealing to democratic values, I suggested, is a little bit more complicated because democracy itself might be justified on instrumental and non-instrumental grounds. And here our views might diverge depending on whether we see mainly instrumental or non-instrumental value in democracy itself. Um, so there we'll just have to think about how we see the relationship between human decision making and democracy before we know um, how contingent our justification for the right to human decision is gonna be. That's the first broad thing. The second thing I've begun to suggest is that the most robust, non-instrumental, intrinsic kind of justification based on the human capacity for moral understanding isn't about the value of compliance with the right to human decision, but it's about the expressive value that such a right would have. It wouldn't really make any difference to anything in practice. It would just express something important about us as rights holders. That would render us as distinctive as moral creatures, is that we care about doing the right thing for the right reasons and figuring in each other's deliberations in the right way. Now, although I've suggested that I find this view pretty attractive, some people will find this kind of non-instrumental, non-contingent, moral understanding-based justification of a right to human decision much harder to swallow than um, an instrumental one. So that's my first two suggestions. Grounding the right to human decision, as intuitive as the idea seems, might be a lot harder than we might have thought. And mounting a robust defense on the, of the idea might give us a lot more than we bargained for. Because it would presuppose a bunch of other significant commitments, including about non-instrumental justifications of rights, certain conceptions of democracy that might prohibit outsourcing decisions 
even if they would promote um, democratic values. And finally, it might presuppose certain assumptions about um, why a moral understanding, if it matters, matters. Okay. With that, I'll briefly mention um, one final question. I won't try to say anything to answer it. Um, this is just more food for thought, really. Um, and it concerns the idea of a human right to human decision. Because there's been talk recently um, in scholarly, legal, and activist circles about the broader question whether all kinds of massive changes brought about by AI and digital technology um, indicate that the time has come for basically a new set of human rights to protect people from new kinds of harms, algorithmically mediated harms. Um, and a lot of us at the Institute for Ethics and AI work on various aspects of this question. But all I want to do here is explain one way of understanding the question, really. Um, now, addressing any question about what human rights there are is difficult, partly because philosophers of human rights disagree about what human rights are in the first place. Um, on some views there, moral rights that all humans have simply in virtue of their humanity. And on other views, they're basically rights that play important political functions that we should understand, not by making any kind of reference about where they come from and why we have them. But regardless of where we stand on those questions, we can just start with the observation that at least one function of human rights is to protect certain interests. And to the extent that our interests are shaped by the world, and the world changes, it makes sense to think that the content of rights can also evolve with the rest of the world. Human rights also serve to limit state power. And they serve to limit the power that states can legitimately exercise over individuals. Now, given how much power state and private actors can exercise over people through the use of algorithmic predictions, um, it makes sense to ask whether new rights are necessary to protect people from the new ways in which power can be exercised over them. And some people have been pushing for new rights, partly on these grounds. Um, Sushma Rahman, um, until recently at Harvard, and Bill Schultz, the former executive director of Amnesty, um, have argued that we should be much quicker to adapt rights to new realities. And they worry that if rights fail to be adapted to new realities, then they'll be eroded as readily by indifference and irrelevance as they are by defiance. But we also want to avoid calling everything important a right, especially in the context of human rights. Because if everything's a right, then nothing really is. Um, that's philosopher Jim Griffin's worry. His worry was that it's a big mistake to think that because we see rights as especially important in morality, we must make everything especially important into a right. And with that, the final point for tonight is this. Certain considerations of justice, for example, can be reduced to a matter of individual rights. It's possible that sometimes our concerns have less to do with individual rights and more to do with much broader considerations. Justice is one example. Um, another is considering democratic values. Now we might face new questions um, about what kinds of decisions we should and shouldn't outsource, for example, even in the name of democracy. And on the individualized treatment issue, in the context of false algorithm predictions, the real question might be what we owe to one another as subjects of algorithmic predictions in an unjust world. And this will involve some kind of account of, for example, how to fairly distribute the burdens of mistaken algorithmic predictions, which again might not be entirely reducible to individual rights. So, Rights are absolutely critical 
but they can't do everything. And sometimes the fact that a decision was made algorithmically raises a special set of concerns about those decisions. And when those concerns are about the absence of human decision making, it's worth, I hope to have shown, um, digging a little deeper to work out precisely what exactly those concerns are. We need to know whether we care about the right to human decision because of all kinds of other goods and values that are at stake, or because we think it matters for its own sake. And as a starting point, I've suggested three classes of considerations, human dignity, democratic values, and moral understanding. And on that note, I think I've kept um, my promise of not giving you any easy answers. Um, I hope at least that's some food for thought. And um, if we don't get to talk here, you can, that's my email, you can get in touch. Um, and I really look forward to hearing your thoughts. So thank you very much. So there, there is now a chance. So thank you very much indeed, Linda. That's wonderful. Thank you. And as you say, it was lots of food for thought. And um, I wonder if there are any questions to follow up on that. If there are. Yeah, Lizzie. Thank you so much for a really stimulating and thought-provoking talk. Really interesting. Lots of really interesting ideas. So one thought I had, you said at the beginning that the right to human decision should be taken not too literally. But just I'm wondering, so... Human's going to mean, presumably, not just any old random guy you pull in from the street, but suitably qualified experts, and it could be you know, several rather than just one. But also, I'm just wondering what constitutes a human decision in this sense. I mean, supposing that, like, um, in, I don't know, maybe supposing I'm a clinician and I'm making a sort of diagnosis, supposing that at some point in the diagnosis I use some algorithm, you know, but then I take the results of the algorithm and maybe I just say, okay, that looks fine, go with it. I mean, at what point does it cease to become human? Do you sort of mean that it's not actually going to be either or? Is, is the point that the human takes responsibility at the end? Is that the crucial thing? Or is it something about the intellectual processes have to be gone through by a human being? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. You mentioned responsibility, which is a really important idea here. Well, what might I say? Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, thank you very much for the question. Um, you mentioned this idea of responsibility, which is really important. And again, I think the deeper question is going to be what's ultimately at stake. So in the context of um, medical diagnosis, as you mentioned, maybe that's one of the contexts where we're quite happy to have an AI model look at you know, data, for example, and then make predictions for us if that's going to be more accurate than humans. So maybe that's one of those contexts where it doesn't actually matter. And maybe the reason for that is that something like moral understanding there just becomes less relevant because there's no kind of, say, normative judgment involved. And since you mentioned responsibility, maybe that's going to be a lot more important in other kinds of contexts where it's not about looking at information and then making some kind of prediction, but making another kind of decision about you know, how people should be treated not in the medical context, but you know, in the criminal context, for example. Um, one question that we have online um, is asking you to elaborate on an idea of human decisions being binary, as opposed to um, computer-based decisions being more probabilistic. OK, binary, do we know in what sense? Well, a yes-no uh, sort of decision was, was what was being invoked, uh -huh. yeah. Okay, well, that might be just as, just as troubling. So one thing I didn't mention is that there are lots of contexts in which we might be worried about human decision-making also, right? Algorithms can be executed by humans just as well as machines. And so when we think about what might be a binary human decision-making, if humans just blindly follow an algorithm that might be no less worrying than having a machine-executed algorithm. So ultimately, um, and maybe that also goes to Lizzie's first question, maybe ultimately it's less about 
who makes the decision, but how the decisions are made and whether they're purely algorithmic or involve something much, much messier. Hi, um, thank you for your talk. I, I guess I had like a, what you said made me think of a few uh, like possible defenses and I'm not sure how they fit into what you said, but I sort of kind of want to just throw them out there and uh, they're not well too filled out, but um, I guess if you, if you take to an extreme what you were talking about, about decisions being made by autonomous agents, like the ultimate ex extreme would be if they were making every single decision. And I guess to me that seems like if you think about that, that can lead you to, it forces you to, force you to think, well, maybe there, there has to be some sort of intrinsic justification for like something intrinsic there that has to be justifying why humans' decisions matter. Because if you take the case of, okay, well, if everything's empirically based and you say, well, AI makes every single decision or whatever it is, then, and you think that that's unsatisfactory, then there's no, there's no empirical consideration that would defeat that. And so that sort of, to me, seems like a reason why you wouldn't, why you wouldn't want, why there has to be some intrinsic justification that's important. And then the other, other couple of points is that, um, as, so I guess I'm interested in hearing your view on that. And then secondly, do you think, do you care about the sort of libertarian free will, like non-determinist position that distinguishes between human autonomy and other, other forms of actions? And then thirdly is the idea that there's a possibility for Christian, the Christian idea of forgiveness, which is impossible under automated decision-making based on statistics and you end up in like annoying game theoretic scenarios. Thank you. Lots, lots of ideas there. Um, sorry, before you um, go away with the mic, could you just say a bit more about the first question? You said that there might be empirical information that's going to defeat something. Can you say a bit more about what you meant there? Uh, yeah, sorry. The first question is, if you, if you consider a world where automated agents make every single human decision, like from, I don't know how, how you would conceive of that, but I guess like within reason every important decision is made then there's like it's weird it's like there's no moral significance at all there if it's just if you just think of these like statistical algorithms with enforcement capabilities then every single human dis every single thing that every single capacity for there to be moral decision making is no longer made by moral agents and that just seems quite undesirable and it seems like there's no empirical Conception it doesn't matter how good that decision making is, but it destroys the possibility for, for like immor like morality itself in a way. I don't unless you assign moral status to these agents, and then that seems like you have to therefore rely upon some. And if you say that's undesirable, you have to therefore rely upon some intrinsic justification rather than some instrumental justification. Okay, good. So it sounds like it sounds like then focusing on something like moral understanding might help, right? Because then you've got that kind of non-instrumental justification that just focuses on arguably properties that humans possess that artificial, non-human decision makers would lack. So maybe that's the kind of thing that would then, then help. Um, okay, so that was your first point. Your second point about autonomy is really interesting also because another thing that I didn't mention is that there's two very different things that we might care about when we think about um, the right to human decision in relation to autonomy. And there's a difference between saying that we want other humans to make decisions and there are certain decisions that we want to make ourselves. And both kinds of things we think might matter when we think about autonomy, not least in relation to democracy. And so maybe this, this sense of not just caring that other people with something like moral understanding should make decisions, but there are certain decisions that are important for us to make ourselves that matter. So I think Tim Scanlon has um, a really nice passage on the value of choice, where he walks through different reasons why we, we care about making certain choices ourselves, even if you know, they might not be the best choices. And some of those have to do with um, kind of expressing who you are as a person. Um, like when when you decide to buy a gift for your best friend, it matters that it's something that you picked out. Um, 
even if they might have you know, chosen something that they liked more. So there's something about those kinds of things that, where we think that there's intrinsic value in being able to decide certain things ourselves that kind of go beyond just saying that we want other people with more understanding to make certain decisions for us. And then you said something after that about forgiveness. Can you just remind me what the question there was? You mentioned Christianity and forgiveness. Yeah, good. Okay, different things going on there. So you might, you might worry about um, not just forgiveness, but also empathy and, and mercy, right? So one big worry that lots of people have is that we value human emotions in lots of contexts, not least in, in war. Um, and that's where some of the considerations that you also mentioned, you know, making... making Judgments and empathizing with other people is really important. Um, I think judges also worry about this a lot. So absolutely, so that might be one class of considerations um, where we might be concerned that something is lost by delegating to algorithms. One objection that people sometimes make in that context then is that people also have the capacity to do really horrible things, again, not least in war. Right, so it's not just that people are capable of um, great things like mercy and empathy and forgiveness. Um, people can also be extremely cruel and they'll do really horrible things to each other. So when we appeal to human emotions, I think we have to be, be careful about why we think they matter and in what contexts you know, they're worth preserving and in what kinds of contexts we might, um, we might worry that... Um, humans might not treat each other with the respect that they deserve all the time. And again, that goes back to the, um, the earlier point about algorithmic decision-making, right? Even when people just follow algorithms, there might be worries about dignity because people then don't treat each other the way they should be treated. So there's nothing necessarily about um, human decision-making that means that we just like, can stop worrying about it. Hi, um, I just had a question about whether a strong argument might be that the reason that you might want to preserve um, human decision making is because it creates uh, sort of norms and rules that you might not want to be created by a, um, an AI algorithm, for example. Um, if you sort of take a dystopian view and think about um, a situation where a lot of legal decisions are made by AI, does that have implications for, for example, um, decisions about constitutional balance um, being taken by a, a robot judge rather than a human judge and whether that's desirable? And also, is that sort of an instrumental um, argument that might have over it um, defects that I'm just not seeing. I don't know if that's clear, but yeah. No, that's really good. Um, no, it's an absolutely important point, right, and kind of gets to this difference between how we make decisions 
and the outcome of those decisions. So when you think about democracy, for example, some people think that it matters primarily because it brings about the right kinds of outcomes. And if you take that kind of view, if there was a way to show that AI makes better decisions than people, then it becomes really difficult to justify something like a right to human decision. If you put more emphasis on how we make decisions, having you know, people deliberate together, for example, and you think that matters in addition and kind of separately from the outcomes that you reach, then you might end up with a much stronger justification for something like you know, a right to human decision and having people um, involved. And so that's where ideas like deliberative democracy are really important. So it's, it's not just about aggregating um, people's interests. It's also about deliberating together and making laws together. Absolutely. Yeah, sort of like a self-governance type argument, right? Okay. Exactly. Thank you. Um, I think accountability came up in, in one of the earlier questions. So I guess I was wondering how, whether there's any mileage in the thought that it's you might have an interest in um, wrong decisions being um, wrongings of, of you. Uh, that is, that when something goes wrong, you might prefer for it to be, for there to be someone who's thereby wronged you than for it to just be something that happened without, without further explanation. I guess just to sort of motivate that a bit, you might think sometimes you might get, suppose you have a really unreliable friend, um, and you might get them to promise to do something, not because you think it makes it more likely that they'll do it, but because then at least when they don't do it, you can be upset with them, uh, and, and, and that somehow makes it, makes it feel a bit better. And I guess I was wondering whether there's a similar uh, uh, motivation where at least when the wrong decision is reached, when it's reached by a human, you can, you can be upset at someone in a way in which you can't when it's just the sort of algorithm having delivered this result? <laughs> yeah, good. Um, that's a really interesting question and it kind of indirectly comes up sometimes in um, the military context because one main argument that proponents of um, autonomous weapon systems make is that, well the hope at least, is that they can minimize harm to innocent people. So that's the, the main argument in favor that people often make. Um, one big worry is a version of what you were saying. It's known as the responsibility or accountability gap. Now, interesting things happen when you bring those two concerns together. Because, I mean, assume just for the sake of argument that proponents are right that using AI is going to minimize harm and you know, maybe save innocent people's lives. But then also assume that we care about accountability and responsibility and we want there to be someone to hold responsible when things do go wrong. How do you weigh those two, two values against one another? Would you rather have a world in which less harm is caused, but if something does go wrong, you can't hold anyone accountable? Or would you prefer a world in which you can hold people accountable, you can punish, punish them and everything, but it comes at the cost of, you know, also more human mistakes and cruelty and more people are harmed. I think another question in that context then is why we care about responsibility, accountability in the first place. So you mentioned that, you know, maybe it feels more satisfying if you get to be um, angry at your friend. And there might be different considerations that go in different directions here. So you might think that one reason we care about responsibility is that we want to kind of allocate... Um, say, compensatory obligations and burdens, right? We want to know whose responsibility is to mitigate harms um, when harms have been caught, caused. Um, but a very different kind of consideration is punishment. And arguably, you need different kinds of responsibility for both things. So when you think about punishment, for example, that kind of presupposes that people are more irresponsible that you know, they've made themselves culpable and that's what then justifies um, punishment. When you think about the other kind of consideration I mentioned, where it comes to just allocating burdens of mitigating harm, you don't need that kind of responsibility. We allocate those kinds of compensatory obligations all the time. Think about you know, post-war 
reparations, for example, or reparations for historical injustice where original perpetrators just are no longer around. So I think once we go a bit deeper and think about what values are at stake, we might find that responsibility matters for very different kinds of reasons. And then how worried we are about things like you know, responsibility gaps is going to vary with what kind of context we're dealing with and what's at stake. Thank you again, Linda, very much indeed. Much appreciated. Um, there are drinks afterwards. I hope people will stay and talk more to Linda. Um, and I certainly have things I'd like to ask myself. But at this stage, let's thank her again. And um, it's a great privilege to have you here to give us our, our first Claver lecture. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. Thank you.